good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are in the world thank you so very much for being here this evening and we welcome you all to the universal universal summit on women and girls and we want to welcome our eloquent and amazing speakers thank you so much for being here i know it's early morning for some of you late in the evening for some of you but you have made it here so and um, we couldn't thank you enough thank you so very much for you know honoring our invitation and for being a speaker here today and um, i have with me my colleagues um shirin who is going to be a moderator and dr adam azombe is the host so I welcome all of you and I really, really appreciate you taking time out to be here this evening. Thank you so very much. It's evening for us here in Ireland. So um, thank you so very much. I really do appreciate you. We welcome everyone here. Thank you for um, all the attendees that have taken time out to be here. Thank you so very much. So then now I will pass on to my host, Dr. Ado Mazombe. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. I was saying good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy to uh, see a good turnout um, for this very sensitive topic that I hope we're going to learn today. Um, I'm going to be the host uh, for the event. The, uh, so I just want to go through a few goals that we're going to abide by. Uh, so the first thing is, uh, until we did it in the mock, um, everyone knows the time they are uh, allocated. Please do not disturb when other people speak, just to have your um, your, your mic on mute. Um, okay, if you, yeah, just when we are speaking, please, um, we like to see the face of the speaker. Um, do not interrupt other people when they're speaking. And if you have questions, please, you can write it on the chat. And guys, those are just a few rules we have. And I hope it's going to be a, a good evening that we're all going to learn. So now I think I'm going to, I'm going to be timekeeper. Once your time is almost up, I'll be writing on the group chat. I'm going to end everything to the moderator of today. Miss Sharon Sandra. Guys, have a fantastic evening and I hope you enjoy and this will be more informative for you. Thank you. Um, once again, welcome everyone and thank you for even having me here. I'm very excited about this and I'm sure we're all going to be learning a lot this evening. And we, I'm going to start because I think we are a bit pressurized for time and everybody's busy. So our first person that I'm going to call on is Vanessa Orji. Um, you've got a three-phase question, Vanessa, and it starts with, what is violence against women and girls, and what are the different types? That's number one. What are the root causes of violence against women and girls? And can you explain the various personality traits of perpetrators and survivors of gender-based violence? Thank you, Vanessa. You may go. Your time starts now. Okay, good evening, everyone. So basically, we all had my questions, and I'm going to start in from the question number one. What is violence against women and children? Violence is a simple word. It's actually a force that is measured on someone with intention to hurt or to destroy. It could be on someone, it could be on a property, but on the, based on what we're discussing today, it's on women and children and there are different forms of violence. It could be sexual, it could be just physical, it could be psychological. But the most important and the thing is, whoever is doing this, perpetrating this, is doing with an intention to destroy a woman or a girl. And there are different kinds, like I've explained different kinds of violence. Yes, that's my number one question. And then my number two question of what are the root causes? Now, I'm a believer of, the human personality. A lot of times when the violence against women is being handled, we look at it from the surface, but there are root causes to everything. Why should someone ever think of hurting a girl or a woman? Why should a man just wake up and wants to hurt someone? And I, I put it, I put it, I, during the research on all of these, a lot of times when I think about why should someone do this, 
it takes me back to the human personality traits. And so I'm going to be talking about our personality traits today and how it can make us perpetrators or how it can make us praise. Yes, we all know, the, the, I, I learned to say the world is becoming very toxic. And when you are in a toxic situation, your personality traits determines how you react. So some people, when a place is toxic, they might go into their shell. They might become very reserved. Some people become very aggressive. And if we all know these personality traits and understand them, it helps us know how to portion our reactions to things. And it helps us, I always say that every violence starts with little, little forms of abuse, traits of abuse. But before it gets, if we all understand our personality traits and we know how to be careful about these traits, we might never allow it to get to violence. It might start as an abuse and we're able to control it before it gets to violence. So I'm going to be talking about our personality traits. Yes, personality traits has been handled by different professionals using colors. Some people use animals, some people use, uh, you know, zodiac signs. I'm going to be dealing from the aspect of temperaments, which is a general look out for the human personality traits. I know a lot of us have heard about temperament. And yes, basically there are four kinds of temperaments that are shared into two. We have two kinds of personalities, the introverted personalities and the extroverted personalities. And these personalities have traits. So now when we say traits, we're talking about those little, little things, those little, little shows that helps you, you know, generalize a particular thing. You can look at somebody's attitude and you can tell if this person is temperamental or not. Sometimes you don't have to see the whole of the person, person's personality. You might just see the traits. And so that's what we call traits. So we say personality traits, if you are, so here basically we have four kinds of temperament. We have the choleric temperament, the sanguine temperament, the melancholic temperament, and the phlegmatic temperament. And now under this temperament, we have, the, we have their traits. And so I'm going to be reading out their traits. With the traits, we can understand where I'm coming from. Now for the strengths and weaknesses of these four temperaments, the cholerics are extroverted, they are result-oriented, they are practical, strong-willed, and they can be controlling, blunt to goodness, opinionated and aggressive. The sanguine temperament, they are extroverted, empathetic, people-oriented, cheerful encouragers, easily distracted, impulsive, talkative, unstable emotions. We have the melancholy. These people are introverted, dependable, detailed, quality-oriented, easily depressed, pessimistic, manipulative, and intense. We have the phlegmatic, introverted, calm, easygoing, dependable, rules-oriented, indifferent, change resistance, unemotional, indecisive, and agreeable. So now I'm going to be picking two major temperaments from here as the, you know, the perpetrator's traits and two temperaments that have the praise traits. The cholerics, like I said, they have the controlling, blunt to rudeness, opinionated, and aggressive. When you bring in the choleric temperament to a toxic situation, their first reaction is aggression. When you bring issues up for them, the first thing, when, when, it, when they cannot understand what's going on in their environment, they fight back, they are defensive, they are aggressive. So when, when a woman is around a man like that, who for every situation, his first move is aggression, you can't be safe around pe people like that. And the question is, a lot of times, this whole, these people, it doesn't end in the, in the home. As bosses, they are the same set of people as bosses, as, you know, as husbands, as fathers, they are the same way. Why, why some fathers with other temperaments would look at a child who is, mess, who is messing up and can just calmly talk to this child? The choleric father can be aggressive, can beat this child to the floor. The same way that he, as a boss, can talk, can, because when I say they are rude to a fault, they can talk, talk, make statements, say words that can destroy your courage destroy your emotions, demoralize you. That's the choleric personality. Now, do not forget every of these personality have their strength and their weakness. But right now we're dealing at the weakness because we're dealing on the things that causes violence against women and children. And, and actually most of these temperaments, usually the temperaments that deals with aggression is mostly found around men. The masculine temperament is a temperament of strength. That's the truth. It's a temperament of strength. And they are not like women who can be very emotional. The, the, the masculine temperament can be very logical. And so when it's logical and, you know, the, wh wh what you're trying to see and try to get an empathy for, they are not seeing it from that aspect. So when they now fall under this temperament, they, it, it becomes an issue for them. 
Then we talk about the melancholy temperament. I said they are easily depressed, pessimistic, manipulative, and intense. Now, when someone has a manipulative trait, a trait is actually a very dangerous thing because now when, so when, when a man who is manipulative comes around a woman, now the set of people who, who perpetuates um, violence through manipulation, now the woman can actually be there and most of the, these people bring more of psychological, psychological, you know, violence on women because you are with them, they are, they are dealing with you psychologically. You do not know what's going on. Sometimes these women, if you listen to them, you see women who cannot even explain what they are going through, but they are going through so much. They are being destroyed day to day, but they can't explain what they are going through. And yeah. sometimes when you get to meet this man, you can't even understand why, you won't even believe this man is doing whatever you're saying, but simply because he comes from the aspect of manipulation. That's his trait. He has the trait of, Speaking and when he speaks, like he speaks calmly, but in that calm manner, whatever he's saying is getting into your soul, is destroying you. He uses words, and and before you know, it moves from just you know words, it, it moves from words, it moves to um, destruction. And so these are traits. Now, when when we talk about these personality traits, we want to understand that if things like this happen, then people need to know about these traits. Now, I come to talk about the sanguines. The sanguines, a lot of women have the traits. They are extroverted, they are empathetic, they are people-oriented, yes. They know every woman has that trait of, you know, being, you know, people-oriented. They want to carry people around, they want to take care of people, they want to empathize with people. And they are cheerful, they are encouragers, but they are easily distracted, impulsive, talkative, and with unstable emotions. Yes, a lot of times you can say uh, some women have unstable emotions. And when women who have this trait of unstable emotions, it's very easy for them to fall into the hands of people who can cause them unnecessary violence. Yes, because, you know, she goes in, you deal with her, you come, you just tell her you're sorry. And, you know, she, some women, the, what they are going through, they're not even talking about it. Like when they are done, when you're done dealing with them, the next minute they are going back in there with that same emotions that they had at the beginning. You're wondering what's going on here. And most of those men with the, the, the melancholy usually have good rapport, good relationship with the sanguine. And usually the melancholy and manipulative people, the sanguines are, un, are people with unstable emotions. So it's actually very easy for a manipulative person to manipulate an unstable emotional person and keep the person down there and you keep destroying this person and the person is still there being destroyed and you don't know what to say and sometimes you really want to help people going through violence and you just can't help them because they can't even explain what they're going through yes a share for those who have on, emo on, on um, unstable emotions then the phlegmatics we say they are indifferent people change resistance on emotional indecisive and agreeable now for someone who is agreeable who is uh, who is agreeable to you know you, you don't make decisions on your own you love to allow people to take decisions for you they are usually praised to the likes of the cholerics who are controlling blunt to you, opinionated and aggressive so when you meet the one who does not like to take decisions you come across the ones who love to take all the decisions it's actually very easy for them to meet together but if the strength do not play out if it's only the weakness that is playing out the choleric personality has the tendency of destroying the phlegmatic personality. And because this phleg, this phleg person doesn't have, is indecisive, she can continue to take everything she takes. And one thing, one day you just hear, oh, she took her life. And you're wondering why she took her life. You might never get one detail of why this person can take her life. Yes, because sometimes why they go through all of this, they don't say a word, they do not explain, they can't even explain. They are very calm and very reserved. And these colleagues just keep doing what they're doing and, you know, they're done dealing with you and they come back to pet you, they come back to make, it, make you look like they are controlling your affairs, they make you look like they are, they, they are your strength, the strength you do not have, but they've been destroying you. And so a lot of times I come to say that the, the issue with personality traits, when I started teaching on personality traits, I, I, there, there, was, there was a company I went to train on personality traits and, you know, I realized a lot of people saying, coming to say, Oh, I cost this person suck because I did not understand this person. Oh, no wonder. I always feel like I do not know what I am doing. Every time this man keeps making me feel like I don't know what I am doing. And a lot of people said a lot of things. And I looked at it like, 
if personality management is something that will be taught, like it should be an orientation program that everybody needs to understand. You just cannot deal with situations that has to do with humans without dealing with the personality traits. What are the root causes? Why should... Now, the truth is, as, as much as there's violence against women and children, yes, there are people that might never, that might never express, express violence or experience violence. Yes, simply because of the level of exposure and understanding they have about the human personality. And they can escape it in the office. Before they let it get to violence, they, they can resign. Some people can work out before it gets to violence. Some people might never be able to work out because they cannot explain what's going on. They cannot explain why is this. So even when you try to solve, now there is a case that had just happened of a woman who has been beaten and battered over by a husband. And suddenly I see them bringing them back together. I have not heard what exactly was done. Was this man, you know, was it dealt with about what he did or what exactly was done? Why are they bringing this couple back together? Is there something that has been done to ensure this does not repeat itself? But no, I just see a crowd of people cheering and this personality are the phlegmatic personalities. By the time the crowd comes to talk to them, because they are not decisive people, the crowd can tell them, just manage, just join them, just go. Okay, um, Vanessa, I think you, that was Vanessa, she's the, the CEO of uh, an educator, she's also an educator that is involved in many organizations. She's really passionate about women empowerment and youth empowerment and uh, development. Um, I think uh, her time functions is out, so I think she had a lot to, uh, to offer. Now, uh, the second person we uh, to listen is Violeta. Um, Violeta, she's uh, a mental health professional and a community development activist and human rights advocate and she also works as a member of the Migrant Women uh, United Network. So, um, Vanessa, you have five minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity. If it's okay, I'm going to share a screen. Um, so okay if you could let me in to share if not i can talk but it might be easier if you could see and while that is happening violetta i'll give you your question in the meantime mm -hmm. and your question is in ireland what is the frequency of gender-based violence cases what nationality and age group is commonly affected and what form of abuse is common within these groups? Yes, um, so if, if the host would let me share the screen, if it's because I'm not allowed, you need to give me permission to share the screen. Okay, I'll try from my side, yeah. If, it's, if it takes too long, I can go ahead and just do a five minute presentation. That's absolutely fine. Um, yeah, sharing so, is the host, so she will let you, um, Violetta, she will, you can share your screen once sharing makes you host in a minute. Um, in the meanwhile, I can, uh, okay, yeah. so hopefully, now, Violetta. yeah, just if you can, can you see the full screen? Yes, I can. Okay. So everybody is able to see the screen? Yeah. Um, so um, as Shireen said, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, what's the kind of stats <laughs> to put in a context, gender-based violence, specifically in Ireland. And even though the question sounds maybe very simple, it's actually very difficult to answer because there is a very little data and uh, this area specifically when it comes to minor women is very neglected. Um, so anyway, these are the stats I found. So in Ireland, the population is 4.7 million and the proportion and non-national, so that would be migrants, would be um, about 12%. 
so in general reporting of domestic violence in Ireland is very low um, but that also indicates that one in three women in Ireland experience psychological violence from a partner in their lifetime and one in four experience physical or sexual violence by a partner or non-partner and that starts as early as age 15. Um, in relation to minority or ethnic or migrant women, uh, it's about 5% in Ireland's population. And the study of gender-based violence and ethnic minority women found that 13% um, of service users uh, um, are the ones who were affected um, uh, by the violence. Uh, this is actually overrepresentation of minorities compared to the general population. Um, so in 2019, Women's Aid, which is a national organization in Ireland and provides services specifically uh, in relation to, to women or who experience uh, um, domestic violence, they provided 229 helpline support calls in another language. Um, and from those calls, 6% identify themselves as a Black and 2% as an Asian. In uh, Women's Aid in 2016, so that's specifically in Dublin, which is the, obviously the biggest population, um, they reported that 28% of the new women in 2016 who used one-to-one -one support services were migrant women. And just over half were from non-EU member states and then 44% from EU states. Um, also, uh, they stated that 250 calls were facilitated in 27 languages um, and 82% of those spoke in EU languages and non-EU including Arabic, Mandarin and Russian. Um, in relation to sexual exploitation, um, so migrant women and the children sadly in Ireland make up between 83 to 97% uh, of people engaged in prostitution. And in 2016, there were 95 suspected victims of human trafficking. Um, so this means that's the, that's the people who, who were forcefully um, trafficked to the country. Uh, from those 301, 11 victims detected by or reported to police between 2012 and 2016. Um, and the majority were subject to sexual exploitation and, and primarily from EU member states. Um, in relation to another type of, of, uh, of um, gender-based violence, it's estimated that 5,277 women and girls living in Ireland have experienced FGM, female genital mutilation, and that up to 1,602 girls may be at risk. Um, I'm not going to go through many details of this, but I would really encourage uh, everybody to read if anybody wants to have more information. Uh, so Women's Aid Research just, just published actually just recently uh, a study which was conducted this year and they were looking um, at abuse in the young people 18 to 25 and um, it's a really very extensive research and it shows a lot of um, it provides a lot of details and understanding so I'm just going to briefly go this is not specifically for a migrant woman and it's not specifically for minorities but it just gives a really good indication what actually um, you know women and also men experience in relation to a violence um, so one in three in the global in the global sense experience a physical or sexual partner violence or sexual uh, violence by non-partner so that's a global stats, which is very sad. Um, in Ireland, 39% of women age 18 to 29 reported psychological violence by partner from age 15. 16% um, of women age 18 to 29 have experienced physical or sexual violence. Um, these are also, as I said, you know, the stats you can you can familiarize yourself. So I'm not going to go into details because of the time, but it just shows. Um, actually that it's very prevalent in a, in a, in a, in a society and it's, a, and it's that as early as I said of age 15. What kind of abuse was reported uh, in this specific group? It was emotional abuse, physical abuse, 
including um, like physical abuse, such as slapping or showing, more severe abuse, punching, strangulation, burning, um, also use of weapons in, a, in, a, in relation to sexual abuse was reported, sexual co co coercion, uh, sexual assault, rape, coercive control, financial abuse. Um, what are the barriers? And those barriers, even though it's based on a research, but those barriers applies also to any woman and, and also the specifically migrant woman. Uh, so those barriers are fearing for the safety and feeling ashamed, especially in a specific cultures. Um, also unsure um, and maybe kind of lack of understanding what are supports available and what are services available. Obviously the poverty, the racism, rejection and language are huge barriers for a, a migrant woman to seek support when and they're facing a gender-based violence. Also inadequate resources, absence of staff training, so kind of misunderstanding really uh, when women presenting and maybe talking about um, about kind of violence or, or, or experiences of, of uh, abuse at home. Um, also the residence conditions. Um, so it means that very often women depend on a, on, a, on a partner's visa or the financial support, therefore they're afraid to seek, to seek support and refuge for themselves. Um, this is also from, from the, the, the current research. So it's surprisingly actually young men are more aware of the services than young women. And I think it's, it shows and indicates how much work we need to do in our in our communities, you know, to provide that that awareness and to educate people in relation to available laws and supports, who would uh, who would support a woman or or, or young man. Um, so this is just a little bit also. So that was based on the 32 services, um, and on average, 1,970 1, women and children have received some type of support. Um, from a domestic violence service each month since March. So that's in relation specifically from March to August, so during the COVID. Um, and those women and children, an average uh, of 575 new women and 98 children assessed the service for the first time. Um, and just on my kind of, uh, from my own experience, I work in, in the Lithuanian community and we set up a helpline specifically during the COVID and there was a, about 50% of women who sought specifically help or information because of the, of the violence or disturbance at home. So thank you. I hope I fit in five minutes almost. You went a little bit overboard. Oh, sorry. Um, I was trying to, no, there was a message that went on to you because I think you were host. Okay, guys, the, um, please let us stick with time. And the third person that we have here is uh, MAJ. And uh, she's, uh, one second. Hi. She's an international speaker and she's a creative consultant and uh, she's really, she loves to inspire, inspire and elevate women and empower them positively. And she has worked extensively on women empowerment across the world. She's really good at this. So I'm sharing to you. Okay, Nija, I'm ready for you. And your question is, what is controversial about gender-based violence in your field and that a general audience would easily understand? First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this and thank you to everyone. I am actually going to set up a timer, if that's okay, because I want to honor anybody, everybody else's time. So I'm gonna put on a timer and then um, Hopefully in five minutes when it goes on with everybody's permission, I will stop. Is that, is that acceptable? Hi. Thank you. So, so um, again, thank you for having me. So when I was asked to speak about uh, what is controversial uh, regarding gender-based violence in my field, well, I literally just uh, stopped and thought long and hard about trying to pinpoint what is my field. 
Um, I'm a consultant, I'm a speaker, I'm a coach, I'm an entertainer, I am an entrepreneur. So uh, that's really what I do. And then I, I got to thinking and I said, well, I am a woman, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm an auntie. And I said, well, you get, you get that, right? So I really do have a little bit more of a holistic view on who I am and what my field is. And for me, my field is human relations, human, human race. That's the field. And as part of the human race, I believe that uh, I have, like everybody else, a responsibility of making contributions, powerful, positive contributions towards uh, the health and wellness of humanity. Uh, so I feel that we have the responsibility of becoming a, a social agent just to ensure that there's equality in the world, that there is a, a sense of unity that we can role model and lead on for generations to come just to create a better world. So with your permission, I am going to address you from the field of human race uh, and being a part. And I believe that as a member, uh, we have the oversight, if you would, that we are not uh, capable as one person in this world to make a contribution. And I want to bring awareness to that because as one person, a woman, a man, whomever, we do have such a powerful ability to make a change. And the oversight is the notion that just because I'm one single person, I cannot make a change. Just because I'm part of the human race and a woman and a mother, whatever, or a, a worker, I'm, I can't do anything to help out. Well, I want to state that first, what we need to do is just uh, realize that yes, we are powerful, so powerful enough to be able to make a change that we need to, for number one, realize that we're part of this field, we're part of the human race. Number two, realize that we have a voice, that we have a responsibility to be leaders for our children, for our spouses, for our world, that we have the responsibility to create and showcase and uh, just a way, a model, a way on how to change the world. Number two, I think that we have to understand that everybody has a right to education, to freedom, to a right to free expression, to safety, to shelter, to food, to water, clean water, to a loving family, to dreams, to just health, to wellness. And I think that once we realize that we can do this, because I don't want to go through statistics. Uh, you have all the statistics. The statistics are readily available. What I don't think it's readily available is the idea that we can uh, just generate the awareness of this oversight that exists just because we think we're not responsible to take in uh, care of others to make it a difference. So the thoughts that I want to bring forward in this, in this particular question is that, you know, that realizing that we are not paying attention to the value of character, to the value of diversity, to the value of culture, to celebrating everyone's differences, to celebrating uh, the, the, the need to, and, and right to a voice, that we are not protecting our children the way to the extent in which we have, that we are not modeling behaviors, that we are not respecting our elder, that we are not uh, looking at our environment, that we are not coming onto the world with this conception that we are just one, one for everyone, everyone for all. And, and if we realize that we have a say in changing impunity, that we have a say in changing social norms and changing the, the, what we believe is the acceptability of subordination, then in what we believe that is the way that um, the, the, the roles, the gender roles are, if we decide, that we can make a difference and we entrepreneur our soul for the betterment of humanity. We really can make a difference. I thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Meiji. And now we would like to hear from not just a survivor, but now she's strengthening many other people. She's now like a therapist. I would like you guys to welcome um, Councillor Sandra E. Paul. Thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me to this wonderful event. I'm quite honoured that you've asked, that Ini asked me actually, um, and welcome to all of you. Um, yeah, so I, my question, I don't know whether you're going to introduce my question before I um, yes, start. I don't yeah, know. okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Sandra, your question is, what is a common misconception about gender-based violence? What is the cause of this misconception and who does it affect? And your second question is, in your opinion, what is the importance of forgiving and healing? Yeah, thank you very much for that. It's um, quite a wide question. Um, and when I thought about how I, would go, how I was going to ask it, um, answer it, sorry, um, my, I think the first common misconception that people have is that gender-based violence is something that is new it's um and it certainly isn't um it happened to me um when i was a young child and after that a number of times throughout my life um until i really sort of got to understand it in my 30s so i've basically um i know something about it um and i I've experienced it and I certainly understand the long-term effects it can have. And this is why I give a lot of my time to helping people who have been victims, who are victims or have been victims of gender-based violence. And I have been doing that for over, uh, since 2011, when I retired from basically full-time teaching. Um, but, Today, um, it's estimated that one in three women or girls will experience sexual or physical violence in their lifetime. But the thing with it is, and I think this is the thing that a lot of people are not aware of, is that men, before they were as they are today, they relied on their reptilian or their lizard brain, their basic brain of survival the survival mechanism which is over 650 million years old and that part of their of the early brain had three main tasks they were to feed to survive and to procreate and the male species primary instinct was to survive and to procreate and to procreate at all costs and those primary goals and instincts are still a key element within men today. And men will basically take what they want because of their primal instincts and because they've been taught and are still being taught, unfortunately, that it's all right. The female species was taught or is being taught to accept it. Even now in the world, women and girls are, be, are being told that it's okay to be used and abused and to um, stay in violent relationships and even in the 21st century it's still being portrayed as the norm gender that gender-based violence is okay and that it's it's still being taught it's being witnessed and it's being experienced as we speak and we are still bringing up our male children to feel that it's acceptable to treat women badly. And we are still allowing the practices of gender manipulation, human trafficking has already been mentioned, arranged marriages, children as young as 11 are being forced into violent marriages and having children of their own, even when they're just children themselves. And there's a lack of education that's the main cause but also ignorance lack of government knowledge of the organizations supporting the victims of gender-based violence and it's but it's also in all corners of the world a, a serious lack of funding 
And this year alone, even before the pandemic, globally, it's been reported that 243 million women and girls have been abused, abused and, that, and less than 40% have been able to report the violence. And I know that in South Africa, 68% of women are being abused and these figures in other countries are even higher. But there is light at the end of the tunnel and organisations are recognising that this is an issue. The UN Secretary General encouraged 146 member states to act and recently another 135 countries have responded favourably. And this has strengthened the cause but a lot more resources are needed if we are to stop the practice of gender-based violence. Thank you. For the, thank you. And I have got a second question, um, and that is um, about um, the um, importance of forgiving. And this is where my experience as a therapist comes in. And this is what I always talk about when I'm helping people um, to end their struggles with any form of violent experience in their life and I always say that's the most important thing you need to do is to forgive any abuse is traumatic whether it whether it be physical emotional or both and when you experience abuse, you are traumatized and, you re and that trauma remains active very often for years and years until you are ready to forgive. Without forgiveness, there is no healing. And I don't mean forgiving the perpetrator. That is something that can come later if you feel that that is something that you need to do. But I mean to forgive yourself. When you allow the trauma to remain active in your mind, you're constantly reliving the experience and your brain checker is on constant alert. Because your brain doesn't have any concept of chronological time, it only understands the here and now. So as soon as you start to remember any trauma, any violence, any un anything that you've experienced, to the brain you are experiencing it right now even though it might have happened 20 years ago as or 30 years ago as it did in my case and your abuser relies on that weakness to assert their control and long after the abuse has ended and not forgiving allows their control to be stronger and the rem and you remain weak and helpless but that is their primary goal when you forgive yourself, you can start to accept the trauma, embrace it, work with it and not against it. Look at it as through, you are looking through a glass wall. It's still there, but you're, you are removed from it and the energy is removed from it. You are removed from the experience, almost looking down on it happening to someone else and seeing it through their eyes. I could go on, I have a lot more to say, but I realise that time is basically running out. But there is a lot more work to do. We have a lot more work to do. And just the fact that we're getting together to discuss this, even if this issue that is increasing as we speak, it's, um, it's really good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um... So now we would like to, lead, to hear from Ekimini. She is the founder of uh, Aulo African Women in Leadership Organization. And she's really passionate about governance and also working in the field of employing youth women to uh, actually do really well. Um, uh, now Ekimini. Hi, good evening everyone. No, I'm not the founder of African Women Leadership Organization. I am the general manager. Yeah, so I just wanted to correct that impression. Good evening from Nigeria and um, I hope everyone is doing well today. Quickly, I'm going to be addressing gender-based violence and um, the norms, gender norms that lead to um, gender-based violence and, can all, and the ways it can be prevented as well. And, and I like to speak very briefly. I'm a very brief speaker, so I'm not gonna, I may not take up to five minutes, 
first of all, I would like to say that there is such a thing as gendered norms, right? So from growing up, um, we filtered the world in terms of gender, knowingly and unknowingly, is is subconscious, and it is um, some of the things that drive the core of the society. And these things translate to gender-based violence. And I would like to point out some of those norms. So first of all, the culture of silence. It's a big deal, right? And um, it's something that is part of our society, knowingly and unknowingly. The culture of silence, the culture of shame for women. Um, we, we like to speak about things that have to do with women in a very, it, it's kind of, I would like to say, in a shameful way. You know, you refer to your period as though it's something you need to be ashamed of. You say, my monthly visitor, you know, we hide um, our undies, we hide our, um, we, we hide our, our, the things that go on with us as women. It, it's part of our culture. It's like a culture of shame. It's a culture of silence. And most times when people get raped in the society, you know, in our families, we want to cover it up. You know, it's a thing of shame that you, you get raped. Even people who experience gender-based violence, they feel ashamed. That's the first thing that they feel. And this is some of the gender norms that need to be addressed. How we perceive things that have to do with women and how we associate these things with shame, with silence, and, and how, we, how we raise our women and our daughters to, to take this up. And the second thing, the second trait or the second culture the second culture that um, that is the second culture that is just um it's not new it has been there for a long while is the culture of blaming women so it needs to we have to teach guys boys males to take responsibility for their sexuality we we do not say to we cannot keep saying to women um, that they get pregnant and it's their fault right or they got raped is their fault or they dressed a certain way. That it's, it's a culture of blame and we, we point hands to women. We have to teach men to take responsibility for their sexuality. We have to teach men that, you know, seeing a woman is not something that should lead to your sexual arousal. It's not a woman's fault that she was, um, she was pregnant and she has to be blamed and she has to be the one to go through a lot. Men have to, you know, have to take responsibility as well. And there's, there's also a culture that emboldens men, that emboldens them to take advantage of women, of their vulnerability, you know, to cross lines, lines that are personal to women. You pass on the street and, and, and it's okay for men to, you know, to make, to tease you, to make advances at you. And sometimes we normalize it. If you're passing and, and nobody makes an advance at you, it looks like it's normal. It looks like it's not normal. No, it, we, we do not have to keep passing across that message to our generation. Okay, thank you. We, we, we keep passing across that message to our, 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 our generations unborn, our children. We say to them that they have to normalize being objectified. And that's not, that's not okay. We have to realize that, <clears throat> we have to realize that women can take decisions. Women can want what they want. It's not a man's world and they do not have to be objectified. They do not have to be people that um, men treat as objects. Men want to cuddle. When you're, when you're in the professional space as a woman, you know, you don't, men don't have to hug you. It's not normal that men want to hug you all the time. No, it's not. There are other ways to greet people. And you shouldn't be seen as rude just because you are not being hugged. You're not, you're not, you're not welcoming when it comes to hug. People shouldn't say to women, smile. So these are some of the, the norms that unconsciously you know, bring about gender-based violence because it is a power dynamic. Who is more powerful? It also, women also become subservient. You know, you are in a position of always giving your power to a man all the time. Those are some of the things, those are some of the cultural traits that, you know, result in gender-based violence. And, and 
there is a toxic masculine culture, you know, where, where men are, um, the, it's called toxic masculinity, where men are not supposed to be emotional, they're supposed to be logical. And they say to women, they say to women, oh, be logical. Oh, women are not logical. No, women have their other, their other, um, other aspects of women as well, not just um, logical needs, not just the logical part. There's the emotional part. That's why I like that the he for she movement promotes emotional intelligence. So men have to learn emotional intelligence. We say that to women to mean that they have to be logical. No, men have to learn that there are emotional needs as well and how can they meet those needs starting from their daughters and, and, and growing all the way up to when they are with their partners and even in the workplace is very important because these are the things that um, these are the things that make up human beings right this, these are the things that make us make up our inherent human capital how are we going to be how are we going to be um to be sorry i have some okay um Sorry, I'm in a noisy environment. I just had to move away for a second. I don't know if I still have some time to conclude. Yeah, sorry minutes. about that. Two minutes. Okay, sorry. I am juggling a lot. I'm at, a, at an event that I'm organizing and I'm also having to be here. Thank you for your understanding. So finally, I would just like to conclude that women have to take up more power spaces and this will encourage women to um, dominate you know positively dominate the world it gives that power aura you know and being able to live with your full humanity and that is allowed that is not something that is um we're saying we're calling it women's rights yes it's women's rights but then we do not have to be promoting it necessarily as a as a right before you understand that the next person is a full human as you and should be able to express themselves we do not have to preach about it as if we want to stand up for women this is something that we should normalize in our society when that power dynamic becomes equal you know and we're able to relate with women as equal human beings i believe that it will not lead we will not another human will not be able to see themselves as more powerful and therefore beginning to abuse the other person thank you so much okay thank you very much for sharing it was very interesting and we would like to hear uh now the first man on the evening um his name is uh La, no, sorry, guys. Lassan. Lassan is um, a pan Africanist, is a human rights activist, a global social justice campaigner with expertise in migration, asylumist, uh, seeker, and also um, refugees issue. Um, Sharon, uh, you question time? Thank you. Do I have to speak or is there any specific question that I have to address? Yeah, there will be a specific question. She needs to give you, you have five minutes. Sharon? Lasan, your question is, in your opinion, how does gender roles influence violence against women? Okay very interesting question um first thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here and thanks for um the organizer for making sure this is addressed because gender violence is not something that we even as men we we can hide or shy away from it's real it's existing and and this is something in my capacity and a role as a the chairperson of the Africa Solidarity Center Island I'm dealing with every day 
almost every week in Ireland. And it's not even what the statistics or the numbers given in, in many other areas. And um, it was said earlier, COVID-19 has doubled those figures and many of the women and girls are really uh, suffering, not even being able to speak out or even to get who to protect them. So I think um, one of the things I will address in this question might uh, be problematic as we men as well as uh, society in general for uh, lack of responsibility, lack of education, um, refusing to, you know, to accept that we are in maybe on the 21st centuries uh, and recognize what might be some of the behaviors we have as men as structural issues and cultural issues that is probably influencing all that. If, for example, a man in the 21st century still believe of being above the other gender because of sexuality or, or, or gender issues, it remains problematic. And that is a constant reality that we, we, we see today, even in Ireland, where some men still give themselves the opportunity, the privilege to, 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 to rule the house or uh, to control the relationship. Um, I, I was so quite amazed to see the different type of 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 of, of characters and 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 and, and uh, definition of uh, of modern and and and, and humors that was given earlier on. But no matter what, um, somebody has given some figures in terms of what uh, we see happening to women and girls every day and every week. So because of that, I, I will think we we still need to um, raise awareness, uh, but educate and encourage men to, to come to reality that we are, we are all human and we, are all, um, uh, we, we do all deserve to live in peace and in, in, in love. Being in a relationship is to love one another, is to you know, integrate each other's life. In, 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 in make it happy and, 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 and lovable. But if it happened that loving each other become, uh, you know, a problematic for one, we might rethink of what we really need in that relationship because it shouldn't be uh, any mean that if the relationship is not working, that you don't give it up. And it's maybe a call for, for women and girls to, to be strong enough and be courageous and don't be afraid to confine themselves to maybe their neighbors or their close allies uh, to, to, for example, I report incidents when people come to me by making sure I take, I put all the protection in place. So the person, the victim doesn't have any fear or worried what might be the consequences. So if you are worried that maybe reporting an incident or speaking out of something might, um, increase the violence or uh, like it's happening in many cases please confine yourself to somebody who can advise you please talk to uh, uh and again some people are afraid of going to the garda station please be informed that uh, at every garda station there are confidential rooms and you're not obliged to go and speak at the windows when you get to reporting um, area ask for a confidential room where you can sit away from anyone watching you or listening to you to talk to a, 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 a guardi and they will take your incident seriously instead of maybe reporting at the window, walking away and wondering what will happen next. So if there are any issues, please, please contact um, those women aid, uh, NGOs uh, like even um, love and care or other people who are working with women and girls and they will take seriously this. Again, um, to finish, maybe uh, just to point out to women and girls that uh, there are a lot of uh, policies and, 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 and laws and resolution in place. For example, the UN International uh, Decade has a section called Women and Girls of African Descent or and Migrant that address all the issues. And these are things that we should use to address it with our politicians, our decision makers, and whoever um, um, can make a change in our community uh, and society. 
So I know my time is up, it's, that's what I said, uh, but this is what I can address in terms of, uh, uh, of cultural change that we need, education, raising awareness, but also women and girls taking really power into their hands, not be afraid of addressing the, the wrongdoing of men because the violence that is happening to them is not happening, they're not doing it to themselves, it other people that are doing it to them. And if they're not happy or they're going through all that, they need to, to be strong enough and we will support that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we would like to call another head care professional, um, Femida. Uh, Femida's work extensively in encouraging many women to be empowered and to know their rights. So um, Femida, maybe you have eight minutes. Thank you. Uh, she um, question, thanks. Mahmida, you have two questions again. The first one is, what are the hidden signs of gender-based violence and what can individuals and communities do to assist and prevent the recurrence of gender-based violence? Second question, how can we support survivors and those at risk and can you share some best practices with us? Thank you very much. Hello and hi everyone. First of all, thanks to NCP and partner organizations for inviting me on this online event. I am Samida Nahid and have been living in Ireland for last 13 years. I am originally from Pakistan. Being a researcher and working with different organizations in Ireland, there are many important issues to discuss about the women. Today I chose to talk on gender-based violence in Pakistan and highlighting the aspect of socio-economic violence and based on my own opinion, I have concluded a very small solution at societal level. In simple words, gender-based violence as discussed by everyone is a physical, sexual, psychological, or economic harm or suffering to women. Unfortunately, the country I am born, Pakistan, has a very bad record while we talk about women, their miseries, and the gender-based violence. Looking at official sources and their statistics, Human Rights Watch, it is estimated that between 10 to 20 percent of women in Pakistan have suffered some form of abuse. An estimated 5,000 women are killed per year from domestic violence, with thousands of others maimed or disabled in the shape of acid attacks, dowry deaths, honor killings, psychological and sexual abuse, abduction, forced marriages, forced, forced conversions, and others. A staggering 32% of women have experienced physical violence in Pakistan and 40% of ever married women have suffered from spousal abuse at some point in their life. These are the statistics given by the Pakistan Demographic and Health Survey in 2012-13. Now if we link the gender-based violence to socioeconomic violence, socioeconomic violence is one of the major reasons of gender-based violence. The feminization of poverty, making women economically vulnerable, is the phenomenon that exists on domestic level in form of abusive relationships. Socioeconomic violence includes many forms, including the taking away the monies of the victim, not allowing her to have separate income or she is earning, not allowing them to spend at her own will, giving women a housewife status if earning from a family business, kept deprived of salary, putting psychological fears and targeted physical abuse to make women unfit for work. The concept to understand is that socioeconomic violence has a deep cause and effect relationship on gender-based violence. In case of Pakistan, it may include denial of access to education, equal pay, denial of access to services, exclusion from certain jobs, denial of pleasure and enjoyment of socioeconomic, political, cultural, religious, legal, and civil rights. It contributes to women becoming economically dependent on their fathers, brothers, and husbands. And this dependency takes away the victim the power to decide, and it causes uncertainty, fear, and loss of resilience. Coming to the solutions, many ideas and suggestions are given. But from, my, from this forum, I want to initiate that we are all have to come up with our own solutions. As women, we are not part of the problem, but we are part of the solution by protecting women by women. Being a mother of female children, we have to tell them that be strong, leave abusive relationships if ever be in them. 
divorce is best if life is in danger. Economically be vibrant, active, and live like a warrior. Fight for rights because a female is the head of house, and once she is strong, the borders of the house are strong, and thus the communities and nations. As the majority of the victims were killed by family members in case of Pakistan, what does it mean that women have a strong role to play in the families? Being a mother of a male child, teach your son to behave like gentlemen. Also, educate your female children their political rights. A woman can do everything. Politically, she can run a nation. She can perform any role as she is interested and, and work for it. Tell them their voting rights and political participation too. If we start the solution ourselves, they will be the first knock on closed doors and will work amazingly. The purpose of all kinds of violence or abuse against women is to make them mentally sick so they cannot think for themselves. If we don't hear, no one will hear. Thank you very much. Uh, Femida, thank you very much. We still have two minutes. Are you, you done? Thank you. Um, now we um, we're just going to call a a female um, activist, and she has worked with our love and care for people. And to be honest, she's a fantastic role model for many women and young kids. And um, we I personally know her, and I would like to introduce Onye Nyechi. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, you know, to speak uh, on this issue of uh, uh, violence against women and girls. Sorry, um, son? My question. My question for her, please. Onichi, your question is, what are the consequences of violence against women and girls? Yeah, uh, we have so many viol uh, consequences uh, against uh, violence against women and girls. First of all, I have to talk about uh, uh, four. Uh, I have four points here. I have physical consequences, sexual and productive consequences, mental, mental consequences, and behavioral consequences. In terms of physical con uh, 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 consequences, you see, uh, so many women. Uh, uh, have been beaten, you know, by their partners. They have bruises. Uh, they have uh, abrasions, accelerations, you know, punches, you know, all over themselves. And uh, you know, all these will make them, you know, it causes a lot of uh, pains. It causes a lot of uh, problems to those ladies and uh, and even girls. Another thing is, uh, you know, in you know, the families, you see, you know, some families where uh, when the woman is being abused, the consequences again is on the girls and the boys, the children as a whole. You know, they see, you know, those things uh, the father do to the mother, and some children grow up to do the same. Some of them, you know, tend to like, you know, behave like the father because that's what they saw in the family. The consequences there is that it grows even into the society. It grows because when the children, if a family that have five children, and those five children see all those things, and tomorrow five different families are gonna, you know, you know, have the same problem because those children have seen it. And some other children, when they see that they can't even handle it, it causes suicide. Some children commit suicide. Some children, uh, some uh, 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 ladies commit suicide. Some of them commit homicide. They kill the partner sometimes. You understand? All the children will end up killing their parents. Ruining their own lives. Those are some of the consequences of these abuses. Some, some of the women too, they have, you see them having depression. Like in Africa, when people have that kind of depression, we call it maybe uh, madness or something. You understand? We give it names. But when, you know, looking at it very well, you see that those women have gone through a lot of, you know, domestic violence in their homes. Some children, you see them, you know, they don't, uh, uh, we call it shy. But because of what they face in their home, no, they don't no longer have uh, self-esteem. 
in them. Some of them tend to face uh, 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 use food. Do you understand? To, to, to cuddle themselves, they, you, you, some of them, you know, lack of sleep, uh, 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 sleep. You see them, they don't sleep at night. You see them having, you know, problems. Some of them, some, some, some of the children harm themselves because they blame themselves. Some of them blame themselves, which really destroys them psychologically. It really destroys them psychologically. Some people, some women go into, you know, drinking alcohol. You understand? Some of them go into, you know, committing homicide, killing their partners. And at in the end of the day, they destroyed themselves and they, they destroyed the, the, the children as well. So what we have to do, you know, to, to stop this is what we are doing now. Raising our voices against it and trying to, you know, speak to our children. From home, we have to start this. Speaking to our children. Marriage is is, 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 is a partnership contract. Marriage is, is, should be, you know, a, a team, a, a, something, you know, like is, it should be a teamwork. You understand? Marriage should be a teamwork. None should be, should try to try to be above, you know, the other. They have to come together because one person cannot be going straight and the other one is bending. They cannot meet. Even if they meet, is halfway. It doesn't work like that. So what we have to be, what we have to do is what we are doing now and trying to tell, uh, uh, make, create an awareness to the women. You understand? To report it when they see it, when they, when they see the signs, they should report it. And when it's life, your life is threatened, you need to do what? You need to move out. You understand? You need to move out for the sake of the children and for your own sake. Because if you die or anything happens to you, the man will still bring another person and continue from where he starts. So we need to let the women know that they are not the problem. The bully is the problem, not you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, all said. Um, now we will um, like to listen to uh, Pema. She's a multidisciplinary professional, and she has. Love of people, love of God, and love of humanity. And thank you, Pema. Uh, she, you have, uh, uh, Shireen, you have some questions for her? Pema, your questions are, is there a link between mental health and gender-based violence? If yes, what is the connection and how can it be prevented? Okay. And then, question, what a role does education play in gender-based violence? Okay, thank you, Shireen. Thank you, everyone. Good evening from Nigeria, too. I wanted to ask if I can have hosts right so that I can share my slide. Yeah, but so while you host already, Femwa, so you can. Oh, I am. Oh, great. Okay. So I, I want to say, um, first and foremost, the answer is yes. There is a very bad relationship between mental health and domestic and, and gender-based violence. A lot of people who survive gender violence, we've heard from other speakers, never really get their act together. The trauma leaves on way afterwards. Um, things like post-traumatic disorder happen to them. Often the abusers themselves were abused at some time in their lives and so it, it's learned behavior it's a lot of brokenness is a lot of soul sickness and then it gets transferred into the next person and and the circle continues the very vicious cycle just continues and that's why so um straight up i'll say yes there's a lot that education can do to make you um be able to mitigate against violence and that's why i would want to share um Yes, I'd want to just share this. Uh, 
Okay. I hope you can all see my screen. Uh, my screen says, why does she stay? And I called it understanding the psychology of abuse because the first and foremost thing you learn about abuse is that it, it, it doesn't start from the outside. It actually starts inside. It's an inside job. And um, I think, uh, I sh um, sorry, I think that was, um, sorry, I'm having problems. Uh -huh. I'm having problems with this slide. I think uh, Vanessa had talked about a case we're having in Nigeria right now. A few days ago, a woman who is a medical doctor came out to say her husband was abusing her. She's been married for six years, has four children, just gave birth to the last, and the man had been battering her and she called him out and you could hear her small children in the background saying sorry mommy very heartbreaking scene a few days later the, the governor of the state comes out and says oh i have reconciled them and then this woman is now giving a speech and she's saying i'm so um everybody please forgive my husband uh my in-laws uh, my, my people please forgive my husband and i mean the outrage is much because everyone is like what's wrong with you this man has abused you and here you are so I want to talk about understanding the psychology of abuse. Why does she stay? Why does a person stay in abuse? How does it start? How does it continue? And how does it become a problem? So the first slide, okay, I just have a problem navigating. I hope I can do this right. Yes. So if, if you look at that photograph that we have there, we have an elephant with a very tiny chain around its leg. And we all know that this elephant can actually break free out of this. But because the elephant has been conditioned over many years to just stay in this chain, he doesn't even realize the power it has. And that's why we said often we're not held in place by our circumstances, but by our beliefs. It's our beliefs that hold us in this kind of situations. So um, what's the first thing that happens? I'd like us to know this. First and foremost, abuse is not an event. It is a process. It does not happen once. It's very unlikely for somebody to, to just hit you or for somebody to just rape you. Well, apart, random cases do happen, but I'm talking about intimate abuse now, whether it's to a family member or to a spouse or you know to, to a love relationship. So abuse is not an event. Usually it's a process. And then an abuser would often note your response to a situation and then he would craft the next line of action. That's why people end up staying in these things. There is usually progression in abuse, but the good thing is that abuse can be stopped or prevented, like we said. So what's the first thing that happens in abuse? The first thing that starts is intimidation. Intimidation is what do you fear? How is your fear used against you? And then there are all kinds of fears. There's a the fear of being alone. There's a the fear of losing love, love. So the fear of loss, there's a the fear of pain. There's a fear of disapproval, you know, and people know these fears. The first thing your abuser would want to do is to know what are you afraid of. And that's the fear that this person would amplify until the person is able to hold you like that elephant and the chain. The second thing that happens in, in abuse is isolation. So the most vulnerable person is usually the one without support systems. And that's why I like to say, be careful of island license. What do I call island license? It's that state of mind where the person tends to um, promise you that it's you against the world. It's just the two of you against the world. And people just listen. And women often get into those situations. So if you're leaving your country and you're going to stay with somebody uh, with, with a lack of support systems, that, that could be an island liaison, especially if you don't have um, a sense of community. Community would always save you as much as possible. So be wary of the person who finds faults with everybody. Be wary of that man who just sees that everybody is doing wrong. The third thing an abuser does is to um, play mind games with you. So he's not completely evil. He's often vulnerable to you. He shows you his pain. Then he causes you pain and tells you you're the bum. And it's the mind games that keep people going on and on and on. Okay, sorry, the, the slides are, I'm, I'm trying to, to just move them up. Yes, the next thing is disempowerment. I think I've heard speakers talk about this. Disempowerment is when he tells you leave the job. I think Hamida talked about this in the Pakistani concept um, context 
of um, don't have your own account. So you hear all kinds of disempowerment, leave the job, sell the car, liquidate the um, asset, make him a co-signatory on your account. You know, generally just weaken the ability for this person to be self-sufficient, whether financially or otherwise. The, the next thing usually with, with abuse is the rewards of making up. Generally, abusers are amazing lovers or generous men. So think about it. There's a lot of makeup sex, there's um, spending spree, there's some kind of reward um, that is given after the abuse has happened. So he makes you think that the 10 minutes of heaven he gives you makes up for the 100 hours in hell. And then the last thing I think I have here is guilt. Because any attempt to break free is an opportunity for guilt tripping. In fact, the more religious you are, the more vulnerable. This is where our religious leaders come in and they tell you, no, this is not done. This is not sanctioned by the holy book and all of that. And then they end up returning the women into their cells. Uh, okay, sorry. So I think, yes. So I would want us to, yes, uh, sorry. Yes, so just the last things for us to ponder on. One is that abuse is not always overt. Most times it's subtle. That's why there's need, like what we're doing now is education. There's need for you to identify, am I on an abusive cycle? Before it gets down to violence, physical violence, it would have been this. It would have been emotional violence and mental violence. So you need to ask yourself, am I getting abused? The second thing is, yes, are you being abused or you know somebody who is? So think about self-awareness. Think about this person. Find out where the person is and be able to take them back. And then I always say that you need to fight by finding purpose. You need to realize that you're more than your relationship. You're a person. You're a person with um, desires. You're a person with needs. You're a person who is here to make a difference. And finally, like I like to say, love isn't synonymous to pain. For some reason, especially for those of us in the African context, we hear these things over and over again. And we end up thinking that if it does not hurt, it's not love. You know, I, I know people who get abused and they just think that if they don't get abused, the person is not loving them. So we need to know these things and just be able to mitigate against them. So yes, it's um, mental, it's emotional, it's, it's sickness, but mental illness can be cured. And I think that um, with what we're doing is the start of a conversation and it's definitely going to go on. Thank you for the time to speak. Okay. Yeah, that was uh, quite informative. Um, really enjoyed it. And I can think of a few people that are in those box. Um, sometimes it's difficult to, when you're trying to raise awareness on your friends, you are seen as the person that wants to break a holy marriage. Um, now we would like to hear a little bit uh, from uh, someone that's experienced with interfaith. Um, as um, Pemwa just outlined here, you know, we all know that, you know, sometimes religious group traditions and all that kind of, does not really help to stop the abuse. So now we're going to hear from Dr. Sophia. Um, Dr. Sophia, she's an author and humanitarian. She's an interfaith and goodwill ambassador. Um, Shereen, do you have a question for her? I do, Dr. Sophia. As a creative mindset expert and author of the award-winning and best-selling book, Optimize Your Creative Mindset, are there creative practices, thinking style or mindset that can help prevent gender-based violence and or equip and empower those who are subject to abuse. Blessings, blessings to everyone. It is such an honor to be amongst all of you and to have this beautiful panel and organized event for such noble cause. And I've learned few things here and there, and this is how we really truly transform transition and transcend to higher awareness. Uh, in regards to your question, um, yes, I'm a creative mind strategist and uh, my passion really is into 
creating and co-creating new and better experiences. Uh, when you're in the fire, it's different when you're out. So uh, compassion and understanding and empathy to those who are going through such harsh uh, and terrible, um, you know, uh, situations and um, violence. And it could be to any human altogether equally. Um, through my practice, I'm also an NLP trainer and master practitioner and coach. I have consulted, uh, counseled a few uh, people who suffered from domestic violence and now from children, uh, meaning teenage age to adults and so forth. Um, my thing that I would like to address is when you are in a situation like that, it is usually the feeling of lack of control that you feel most within that situation. And that area, the best way to empower it is really through our mindset. And when we have mentalities transformation to ensure long-term system structure that is going to be effective. And this is something that is done collectively more than individually, but each individual contributing can really contribute to the betterment of all. Um, I have used different modalities for people uh, who are dealing the aftermath because there's post-traumatic stress and of course a lot of people suffer from depression, isolation and so forth. So finding a support, trusted, non-judgmental system that is there is very important. Learning about cross-cultural intelligence because you see uh, different cultures, traditions, and religions, um, teachings and beliefs at core value can influence, impact completely the behavior of a person uh, and how they understand their own map of the world based on the conformity that they've been put in and conditioned to believe, which uh, our speaker just earlier, I love the elephant uh, uh, image and uh, uh, all that was amazing and beautiful because it is very helpful because we need solutions. And that happens through awareness and teaching uh, young, at a young age, about a uh, different uh, mentality, how you look at things, you know, like the awareness, but the meta awareness structure, which is the awareness of what you're aware of you will have more situation awareness as well. To create a safe space for yourself, meaning even the environment that you're in is what really influences most. So if you can always try to find a safe environment, even if you are in a house, because right now with COVID, we have seen increased 30, some countries like Mexico, 50% of domestic violence increase during um, the pandemic. Uh, but how can you create a safe place in an environment that is very toxic? As a start, if you can change the environment, if you are able to create a space within the environment that is more safe for you to escape to, a modality that I would like to share is an NLP, neurolinguistic programming of the brain, is called association and disassociation. When you are associated to something, it's you, it's happening to you, then your emotional core to it is more intense. But if you can take yourself and put the situation outside yourself in a mental image outside of you and view it from that perspective, you are going to be able to deal and, and transition and find a plan a lot better because the emotional attachment is changed. If you look at it as a horror movie while you're in it, there's a role you're playing until we, you know, we, we keep getting what we get because we tolerate what we're having. And sometimes it's a process and it takes time because there has to be an outlet to take this control that you lost back. So whether it's physical, through um, maybe taking self-defense, 
uh, classes that are specialized for people or who have been abused and uh, have the you know violence gender experiences because they are very understanding to that mindset while they're teaching you the self-defense techniques it's going to give you a sense of gaining power back whether it's through arts and or sports it will channel the energy different but it also will make you feel a gain of a, a self power and uh, that is going to be important self concept Carl Rogers actually addresses a beautiful way on self concept which uh, really identifies in three different categories uh, the self image uh, self esteem and worthiness and the ideal self uh, once a self concept is strong uh, even if you experience something because it's meant in your journey and you weren't aware, you won't allow yourself to completely stay at that. Uh, so I encourage everyone uh, to really connect with their inner strength and power and to seek professional help when needed and for us to continue doing panels like this to spread more awareness. Blessings and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sophie. Uh, just so we have five more people to go. Oh. Yeah, guys, um, you know, when a, a violence has been, is happening and we are there and we keep silent. My grandfather once told me that if someone steal and you are there and you are looking and you are not saying anything, you are also contributing to what the person is doing. Uh, to say that, you know, if we look around, I don't want to name countries, but we know this country in the world where there's 11 year old that is constitutionally recognized to get married. And there is 70 something old men that marry those kind of people. I think we, we should, I think what I just think sometimes is that the ladies in the world should be more vocal on the issue that touch their own gender and this will the more noise we hear but there was a lot of noise on fgm and today we are happy to say that he has significantly reduced and this is something that we need to raise more awareness so everyone here if we can look really we know someone somewhere that's been that is being abused or that fit the criteria. Like, um, we would like to hear from another person. She's a woman. Uh, she's a digital. She own, she's the owner of a digital marketing company. She creates and supports to empower women. And her name is Lisa Ohogan. And I would like us to hear from her. Thank you. Sharing. Hi everyone. Yeah, I am in. Sorry, okay. Lisa. And sharing. You have the questions. So. Uh -huh. So the question for you is, in line with what you're doing, in the age of technological advancement, how can we make best use of ICTs to counter and eliminate the scourge of gender-based violence from the communities living in remote peripheries and in underprivileged regions? Thank you, Shireen. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank love and care for people for this opportunity and I think it's uh, one of the good things that brings everybody together to discuss issues that is affecting everybody globally. The way um, I remember, uh, I think it was Sandra said, this is not new. Uh, Gender-based violence has been around for a very long time. But now because of ICT, uh, because of technology, we are able to see what's happening in different uh, countries, what's happening in different communities, that it's affecting everybody. Every race is affected. So to answer the question, I can say ICT, it's one of the major problem that uh, helps to support the underprivileged and in uh, remote peripherals which is called maybe the villages and those uh, who are underprivileged like so i can just say uh, the definition of ict in 
in full its information and communication technology, which include anything to do with internet, wireless technology, which is radio, uh, the phone, the telephones, um, plays, and all that. So there are a lot of things that um, we can give an example that people are using nowadays, which is the first one is the mobile phone. A lot of people, they use mobile phone. Uh, in underprivileged areas, it's so hard to use that. We are talking about uh, the areas that is like advanced, which are able to uh, afford all these things. So in my question, it's more based on the privileged, underprivileged and uh, uh, in remote uh, areas. So as I said, the biggest problem is barrier to all these tools, barrier in access to I ICTs. So all this is because, you know, uh, technology is expensive. So these people, they are unable to uh, afford a mobile phone. They are uh, unable to afford a TV. And the other major, uh, major issue is literacy. Uh, most of them, uh, they cannot read. And uh, technology mostly comes with language, which most of the common language is English. So even if they have a mobile, they are able to understand the applications and what, uh, what they can do normally apart from texting or social media. So uh, the other problem with ICT is the cultural norms because in remote world, in remote regions, it looks like, okay, ICT is for more advanced people and uh, it's for men, you know, men should be using more technology than women. So women, they're, at, uh, they're having issues, you know, because they don't have access to all this. So the things that can be done, I can say what can be done to, uh, to prevent this, to reduce all this. I think mostly it's based, it's, um, it's the government at the very topest who should introduce the laws and the policy. They should toughen up the laws and policies by mobilizing uh, their own policy, as I said, and also the media to ensure this awareness of gender-based violence and mostly uh, against women and children. So the media can use radio, as we're saying, like uh, technology is its cost. So media, as in radio, as in playing uh, games or dramas or plays, you know, those things, they help to spread the news in the remote because in the remote, at least they can afford the radio. They can afford, they can see a poster uh, if it's posted somewhere. And the second thing is to introduce the reporting system. As everybody say, not everybody, but most of the people say like women, we feel ashamed to report if something has happened to us. So if there is a reporting system i think it can help everybody it can help the, those people the victims and everybody and the last one i'll just say it quick it's the collaboration between the law enforcement because those are the major issues also and also the community by identifying the leaders in the community in each community and also uh leading awareness to who to report to and what to say if something happens to you and uh, I have a lot to say so I've just got everything short and I'd like to thank uh, everybody also for this opportunity thank you yeah okay the before before last um, thank you very much Lisa it was very good um, we would like to hear from a dance an Indian dancer and a community leader 
a community leader and a, a lecturer at the great university here, Cork University Hospital. No, Cork University College Cork UCC. Sorry, her name is um, Dr. Lika and Lika and Shirin. Some question for her. Okay, I think you have the question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, no, okay. Um, okay. Thank yeah you. Good evening, everyone, and thanks uh, for inviting me. Um, and uh, Inu has kindly just just asked me, uh, "Can you do this?" And when the topic came up, I was like, "Yes, of course, I would do this." Um, and so I just would like to share my screen, if that's okay. Um, it says host disabled. Um, Sorry, Lika, one sec. Let me read out your question. Oh, okay, Shirin is back. Shirin, your duty. Lika needs Lika needs her question, please. All right, I'll do the question while you sort out the rest. The question, Dr. Lika, is what is gender racism and how does it affect the lives of migrant and ethnic minority women and girls? Yeah. Thanks, Shirin. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm just sharing my screen, Chrome, okay, uh, can you see, can you see my presentation? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, I would actually want, I wanted to start off with a poem, uh, which I had written about this, uh, but I think I'll keep that for the end if I have some time, uh, uh, because it's about something very similar on the lines which I'll be talking today. Um, so, what is gender racism? Um, it's a form of oppression that occurs during, um, you know, due to race and gender. And it's perpetuated due to the prevalence of perceptions, stereotypes, and images of certain groups. And racism is defined as a belief that all members of each race possess characteristics or abilities specific to that race. So this is this is like a like this is a definition of what gender racism is. Uh, but I'm not here to literally tell you know uh, state this because I, I've heard from different speakers today, and uh, in fact. Uh, I was thinking what I should talk about, but I think all the speakers gave me beautiful ideas and um, thanks to Vanessa and all the speakers may told a wonderful statement that human race is powerful. Um, and Councillor Sandra said uh, that you don't need to stay in violence, you can fight back. Um, and also Famida said that divorce is best um, when it comes to that uh, point. And the, there were a lot of other different thoughts which came up. And so I would just like to say that awareness should actually be from home. So if every community decides, um, then it, it, that this should not happen in the future, it would be a gender racism free zone. So I, I'm sure like um, the audience would agree, the speakers and, and the panelists would agree that um, at one point, all women, um, in fact, the women specifically, uh, would have their identity threatened for some at one point in their life, and uh, this uh, this uh, allows me to like tell out four examples which I had actually based on for the stuff. Uh, one is within the Indian community, like Famida was telling in the Pakistan, uh, how 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 uh, how the community is there, even in the Indian community is the same that men are considered dominant and they are superior and women have no voice they are considered as slaves or not i wouldn't call slaves literally they don't have any voice you know uh, and that kind of gives me a, i wanted to share an example which happened in my family um i cannot tell the names uh, due to some issues uh, but what happened was um she she was she was married she was happily married for like 15 16 years uh, but certain times she would be abused by her husband but she wouldn't say anything and one day she was actually uh, having her menstrual cycle 
uh, you know, women suffer a lot during this time. They are very irritated and so on. At one point, just because she was not happily serving breakfast to her husband, and you know, they argued for they argued for just a very small. It's a very small issue, but he got so angry that he literally kicked her on the stomach. You know. And she, she, she took it, she took it and she just kept her mouth shut because she's a woman from the Indian community and she had no other choice. She just told her mother that her mother said, uh, okay, what should we do? She said, I just want to stay, you know, safe for a few days. She went to her mother's place. She called me and I said, did you report? She said, no. And I asked why it's just because you no, know, he's my husband and you know, he has the right. I was like, no, he doesn't. And I had to convince her to just go to the police, to the guard up. So in, in India, it's called police. And we just go, I convinced her to go. And what she did was she just told the police, can you just warn him? You don't need to arrest him. Just warn him and leave him and he'll be fine. But that hurt his male ego, you know. He kind of, because he's just, you know, a big, she works in a nationalized bank in India. He felt that a woman had called me to the police station and that shouldn't have happened. And from then on, she still lives with that person. From, but from then on, they don't live like a husband and wife. She is like a maid there. She's treated like a maid servant. Basically, she just cleans the house, takes care of the children and that's her work. And she, she doesn't have any other voice. That's the first example which I want to give, which is happening within the community. Now there are across communities, which I have faced. I, I'm, uh, uh, I was actually, um, when I came, Ireland was a foreign country to me and uh, a Colombian, um, he was uh, working in my lab and uh, he just refuses to accept me as a human being. He just says, Oh, well, you know, you are, uh, you are a girl, you are a lady. And he just refuses just to accept me as a good researcher. And one fine morning, he just used all kinds of words. And I literally didn't take it. And I went and reported it. And that's my, that's that I, I got the strength from another colleague who said, why are you standing and listening just because of you are a woman? You, you can fight back. And that's what I did that happened across community. So you, I'm, I'm giving you a certain example so that you can know, like it's not just within the community, it's even across different communities it happens. And what I would like to wind up by just have, giving you one more example, which happened to one of my friends uh -huh. here in Ireland. Uh, she's a very good mother, but she was actually, literally one Irish person came to her and said, you're not a good parent. You're just leaving your kid as such in the bus stop. Okay. She was actually tired. She, her, her son was just next to her, but she was questioned. But if that was a white person, would they question? No, she is an Indian and that's, she's, she's from a different community and said a question and that traumatized her for, for almost a week. And she tried, she had doubts that she, uh, you know, a good mother. Now, so what I would like to say is now I am showing you a picture wherein it's every person, every human race has a man and a woman in them. Now, this particular statue in India, it's called Ardhanari, which is half man and half woman. So respect all genders ex uh, equally and, res and respect should be not just within the communities, but also across the communities. So that both women and men can be proud of their identity and live fearlessly. So if there is time, I'm just going to read my poem, if that's okay. I, I'm not able to see the chat because I'm sharing my screen. Is it okay, Edo? Can I? Do I have time? Your time is finished, but if you can do it in 30 seconds. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. So that's the translation of my poem. So I'm going to tell my poem in uh, my, uh, in, my, in one of my um, native language, which is called Tamil. Naan yaar. Naan oru manidan. Anal samuham yennei pennai veer pirittadu. Adinal yen ullei oru bayam nanam solla mudiyada unarchigal moodi kondei irindadu. Yen ullei oru kelvi 
எப்போதும் உறுத்தி கொண்டே இருக்கிறது ஏன் நான் ஒரு பெண் ஆணே ஆண்களுக்கு இந்த சமூகம் ஒரு மரியாதை பெண்களுக்கு ஒரு ஆட்சேபம் ஏன் இந்த வேறுபாடு வேறுபாடுமன் for that reason i have developed fear shyness and all other emotions have surrounded me i have only one question hovering in my mind why did i become a woman society respects man but disgraces women why this differentiation is it wrong to be a woman naan oru pen aanal enna enakkum ellam unarchigal undu naanum en padippil en vil velayil uyira mudiyum inda verithanam ennulle erindu konde irundathu அந்த தீ எனக்கு ஒரு லட்சியம் தந்தது இது என் தனித்தன்மையை உயர்த்தியது இந்த நாள் என்னை சமூகம் ஒரு பெண்ணாக மட்டுமில்லை ஆனால் ஒரு மனிதனாக கூட மரியாதையுடன் காண்கிறது அது என்னுள்ளே ஒரு வெற்றி உணர்ச்சியை எழுப்பி உள்ளது நான் ஒரு பெண் ஆனால் என்ன நானும் ஒரு மனிதன் தானே ஸோ ஐ டூ ஹாவ் எமோஷன்ஸ் ஐ கேன் எக்ஸல் இன் ஒர்க் இன் ஸ்டடிஸ் த ஸ்பார்க் இன் மீ ஹஸ் லெட் கண்டினியூஸ்லி த ஸ்பார்க் கிவ்ஸ் மீ அன் ஆம்பிஷன் டு ஒர்க் ஆன் இட் கிவ்ஸ் அ நியூ ஷேப் டு மை பர்சனாலிட்டி today people respect me not only as a human being but also as a woman this that ignites a feeling of victory inside me so what if i'm a woman i'm still a human being thank you fantastic poem and uh, i'm going to we're going to it's going to be posted anyway i yes is not it uh, guys we would like to hear for our last speaker for the night is a fantastic always happy um youth advocate and um he's passionate about empowering young people girls especially his name is Unisa Kamara and Unisa your question is how do we prevent violence against women and girls well first let me just thank each and every one of you It's sincerely an honor to be on such a platform and with such great honorable people and I want to thank the organizers for such an event. There are so many ways to educate. Now speaking from a man's perspective that is us men are very visual. We are quite visual and let me just set my time here. I do apologize, excuse me. We're quite visual. So I'm going to share my screen. I have some things I want to share with you guys. But before I get into that, speaking from a psychological aspect, the way that we deal with because I also deal with um Cap Black Fathers UK. So the way we deal with this men is that we try to use their conscience. We don't use their subconscious, we focus on the conscious. because the conscience is what is actively going on a day to day basis now the subconscious is when we got we have our bad behaviors and that's where the triggers are i used to see my dad hitting my mom i used to see my brother be in his wife and so forth and being a child i have all that on you know what i will show you guys is the fact that that is embedded in the child and when that child grows up those images they tend to reflect on that and they tend to get physical anger kicks in and so forth so we tend to use their conscience and and what we do to empower them to let them know a woman is a nurturer a woman is a sister a woman can is your daughter and when you get ill 9 out of 10 is your partner who's going to take care of you so we tend to use that conscience aspect and being that we are quite visual we tend to if i can just share my slide here i'll just show you guys two of them now if you focus on this one you see as a man we are quite visual as i stated you see a young girl on the stairs that is on the top right hand corner you know from everything that she's saying from hearing and then you have the boy here as well again these are things that that, that they're taking in then if you look at the one at the bottom you see the father and the mother screaming and the child is just embracing a teddy bear we try to let them envision what 
the other person is going to forget about your partner. Let's think about the audience, and the audiences are the children. The children are who suffers. So when we get these children in our circumference, which indeed I work with kids, the youths, we try to let them know it's not your fault, you know, and also when we deal with the parents, the men that is, due to the fact that I'm speaking from a man's, you know, perspective, we try to, because there was a study done in America where they brought in these abusive husbands, where they would not tell them how the experiment was going to go. They will have them outside in the corridor, and then they'll bring them in gradually, one at a time. They'll have the wife in a coffin. Now, this is a woman that you say you love, and that you abuse them. Now, think about the psychological aspect that's happening on that woman. Think about the fear of her having to cradle in a corner. She's sincerely screaming, help me. Who's, uh, you know, it's only you that can hear her. Now, because the fact that you've been so abusive to her, her voice is no more. So we try to let them envision what these women are going through. Now, as men, when you come to our children, we say, okay, that's my daughter. We know how much you love your daughter. Now, imagine how would you feel if another man is abusing your daughter? Would you want someone else to intercede? Would you want someone to get involved? How would you want society to intercede? Imagine your daughter having to make love to a man that she fears. Let's think about this for a minute. Imagine you laying next to someone that, that is in fear of you. Imagine someone having to get up early in the morning thinking, how is this man going to get up today? Is he going to get up on the good side or the bad side? So everything that we do, we try to let our men, our youths that we deal with visualize. And as I stated in the beginning, us men were quite visual. And Dr. Ado can also agree with me in that aspect. We need to get the men involved, the men in the community involved into this. Now, as someone stated prior, I know my time is up, ladies and gentlemen, but if I can just have a minute or two. Men admire football players, actors, and so forth. We need to get a lot of men involved. You don't hardly see a platform as such with men. If we can get men together to speak on this issue and say, listen, this is not right. Religious leaders, community leaders, the government. I deal with a lot of males, and this is one thing. That's why when any call me and ask me, do you want to get involved? I was more than happy to. I'm quite passionate about this. No one has the right to abuse anyone physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, in any aspect. Let's visualize from your child's perspective, view. I thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. Um, these were everyone, everyone that we spoke. I would like to, I will leave uh, Shireen to speak and Amy to come back again. But I hope that as we have attended today, the purpose of this uh, all getting together is not just we meet, we have a Zoom meeting and then we go back, take off a cup of tea and that's it. But this is not the way we will get this awareness to change. Every one of us here is an actor. We, after throwing a, uh, a little stone in the water, there's a ripple effect. We will really encourage everyone among us to become hero and sheroes. Yeah, we have spoken about women being victims, but there's also men that are victims. There's also children that are victims um, that we also need to acknowledge as well. The, um, I hope we will just need to reflect on a few points that I just came out of. Our 
if we can have our religious leader to teach us or to raise awareness about those issues within local groups, prayer groups even, um, that there is no no and there is uh, abuse can also be a reason why someone should come out of marriage instead of seeking uh, for their own health sake. Because just a little short story, there was a, my mother little sister, um, she was married to this man and the man actually cut her off from everybody. The lady came to Europe and she was walking but she was told that she, the, whatever money she take in the post office is for the man and she cannot handle money and she believes she cannot go to parties. She should not associate with everybody because everybody is jealous of their relationship. And she agreed with all those stuff and she was there. She woke up at five, five o'clock in the morning. She had to cook everything and then she goes to work and she will come back and she wants to wash the husband's feet and get the food on the table. And that's just the way she was living. She made a lot more money than the man, but she gave all the, to the man and she never did anything. The clothes she was wearing were charity, charity clothes. She kept on that thing, but the sad story of, you think about a couple of years ago, in Imetel, you got the story, she died. She died, and there's one that she died. Um, she okay, she died, but also there was another abuse that she fed. The man was with her in Malo, but the man went to marry someone else in Balinkoli, which is like 50 kilometers. No, 50 kilometer. She's marrying someone in there, and she got all her children to go and be witness of that wedding. And she she was just at home. Later on, she died. All the people find out she died. There was an awful smell coming from the house. And then people, so every time, and people say, oh, this is the worst thing, but the problem is like many people, especially in Europe, is like we cannot advocate, it's like people have this barrier that you cannot look into ourselves. Uh, if you, anyone here in this group, know any politician, any uh, decision maker, just to really to share this, we need to have this thing out there. We need to tell the young boys, because as a young boy, when we were growing up, we were told that we are the leader of the women. And we didn't even know what the meaning of leader is. You'll be the head of the marriage. You'll be the head of the family. You don't really understand what it is. So you tell you, you should be a leader. In, well, in Africa, when they say you're a leader, you know that you have to avoid all your power upon somebody. They did not explain to you all it is. And all I saw growing up is just violence, violence, violence. And this is some of the things we, we, we see. Our tradition is that like when a woman get married, like they sell the woman to you. And they say, oh, now you have bought her head. A woman is seen as a commodity. And for me, I would like to say something about the music industry as well. The way women portray themselves uh, is not really positive as well. But in all these things, I think there's no, 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 no reason to, um, for violence against women in this world. And growing up, the people that was more clever than me, I always believe the most clever people in this world, no matter how you are, you, you should know is always women. Women are the doctors. Our mother are the doctor. They are the scientists. They are everything. Your mother is a doctor. She's everything. It's, even though she doesn't win the global prize, but your mother is the first doctor that was there for you. She's every single thing. And um, really, I think I'll come back to what Inisa said. I will personally not want someone to abuse my daughter. I think I will. May I'm actually get a gun to go to whoever abused my daughter. I think we need to be seeing it. Guys, please, after today, let us share more, more posts on our social media or whatever way we should do. Let's have the women protected because Hillary Clinton said, this world is poor because the greatest wealth that God has given to us was women and we have now let them unveil their, their gift to save humanity. And in fact, all the politicians we have are usually men and they actually wreck this world. I think our support to have women to rise to the top because women, when women ruled Africa before, they were peace and abundance. If today we have businesses doing very well in the world, it's because women are the, the one that's feeding us globally in every country. Guys, I'm sorry I don't want to talk too much, but look, to be women, you guys need to believe in yourself very much because you guys are the best thing that God has ever created. And you need to stand up for your rights, stand up to empower many other women behind you. I uh, don't want to speak too much. Um, thank you.
All right, everyone. Thank you so very much. That was a powerful session. I suppose we'll all agree to that. Thank you so very much, my moderator, Sharon. Um, probably you have one or two things to say before we round up. Shirin, you're mute. We can't hear you. Okay. I think the only thing we were still going to do is to find out if there's anybody that has any questions that they would like to pose. Yeah, I actually got a few questions privately. Um, I will, I will just read out the questions and probably um, if any of the speakers um, want, we're not going to, you know, pick anyone particularly, but, you know, you can just raise your hands if you would love to answer um, the question. So we have a question from one of the participants and she's asked, domestic violence has increased as a result of the lockdown. Can can you explain the factors that may contribute to this? Can any of the speakers please respond? I want to respond to that. I can't. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Can I go ahead? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so um, basically, okay, I, I remember I talked about traits and so it's the same way domestic violence went so high, there were people who were able to keep, you know, create greater bonds. So, like I said, during toxic situations, the way people react to situations uh, uh, matters a lot. So a lot, of, a lot of men have this masculinity, you know, have this um, aggressive personality. And during the lockdown, you have to be with someone. You don't have the opportunity to do whatever you want to do. Sometimes some people might have somebody, a man might be angry and might decide to go out, drink with the boys. Many of them handle situations like that. But during the lockdown, there was no opportunity for that. So the only opportunity they had to pour out their aggression, their frustration and all that was on women. So basically, I think the purpose why this went like right this they have the traits they never dealt with. It's there, it's just there, it's just part of them, it's part of their personalities. And so there was just an opportunity, just one opportunity, one way to pour out frustration. And that one way was true aggression. And a lot of women went in for that, so. Okay, thank you very much for that answer, Vanessa. I think um, Sandra as well responded. Thank you very much, Sandra, we really appreciate that. Um, Geraldine has a question, so I'm going to, you can unmute yourself. Um, excuse me, look, can I just respond to that? Please, Any. Now, you did state that, um, you know, the abuse went on during the lockdown. Now, we need to understand, imagine you being at home with an abuser. Now, the time you get your time to yourself is when this abuser apparently goes to work. Now, this abuser is at home with you. You're, you're scared, you're frustrated, you cannot watch TV. The smallest thing triggers this aggressor. Because I don't want to call, I don't want to keep using the terminology abuser, abuser. Let's just say the aggressor, which in it, they are aggressors. Now, here in the UK, we dealt with the government where there was a phone line set up. In case you're being abused, you don't have to call and talk. You can just call the number and put the phone under the pillow and police will come. And they're not gonna call you back and they're not gonna speak on the phone. So during the lockdown, yes, it did increase because there was a, there's a lot of frustration. Ima just imagine living in a one bedroom. You have nowhere to be and this aggressor is drinking in the house. Where is he going to vent? Where is he going to take out the anger? Where is this, all that alcohol working in their mind? Where are they going to, you know, who are they going to last out at? So doing this lockdown, absolutely positively, it did increase. Okay. Thank you very much for the contribution, Unisa. 
Okay, um, just because of the time, um, we are just going to have one speaker answer one question. Are we in agreement just for time's sake? Is that okay? Because we have a couple of questions coming. Um, Geraldine, you have a question. Please go ahead, dear. Uh, yes, Any. Um, does abuse occur due to anger issues or the perpetrator losing control? Can we have a speaker answer, please? Can she put back her, her question, please? What was? Does it does abuse occur due to anger issues or the perpetrator losing control? Both. On my side, uh, yeah. You want to go ahead? No, no, no. Go ahead. Yeah, on my side, uh, I will say that both plays um, uh, uh, an important role on on abuse and violence on on, 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 on on women and girls at home or in, in relationships, because if you like uh, the question that was asked earlier on is one of the one of the the, the, the thing to 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 acknowledge that lockdowns has enabled families and friends to discover better the 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 the, the close people like the, the 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 partners or husbands because if you had been living with somebody for some time and then it's only like few hours um in the evening the person comes and just for 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 one or two hours for entertainment before going to bed and waking up in the morning disappearing and coming the night it might have been difficult for you guys even to discover each other really uh, honestly and then with this lockdown um, the person is now forced to be in the house constantly with you and what he's used to do is no longer to do, able to do them outside the house and is becoming frustrated and um, anxious and and angers lead to all to, to all that so it's what both, both plays an important role on the abuse and um, everyone should be mindful of that. If you notice that your partner is um, behaving badly because of anger or, or, or aggressively to, towards you, yes, look for a solution. Talk to somebody who can help you. And again, confidentially, uh, confine yourself who can somebody who can help you. Thank you very much for that lovely response, Lazan. Okay, we move on to the next question. Please, we, we only have probably five minutes before we finish this. So guys, please, just one minute per question. And if you can even go lower than a minute, if you have, and if any other speaker have an addition or even the participants, feel free to use the chat. Like I see a lot of, um, you know, um, contributions coming in the chat. So please feel free. Thank you guys. Um, what is the impact of abuse on children and how can you support a broken child? Can, can I take that question? Yeah. Okay, Thank yes. You. So, yes, I, I think I have seen children, very young children, that learn the behavior. So let me start with boys. Boys are likely to learn because they look up to their father figures. Girls are likely, the daughters that have seen their mothers being abused are likely to allow themselves to get abused later in life because they also watched that and they saw it become normal. But then it doesn't work um, the same way for everyone. There are others who are traumatized. There are people who lose um, a sense of identity and, you know, start hating the other gender because of the things that they have seen happen. So I think, um, what do you do to um, help a child? First and foremost, I would start with saying, if the situation is violent, remove yourself from the violence. If you're a woman who has been abused and all of that, you do need to prepare to make a safe place for yourself and your, your family. So there's need for you to heal. And then there's need for you to learn to get stronger, to be able to take care of the people under you. I'll stop here, one minute. Thank you very much for respecting the time. Okay, there is a question here, um, but I think one of the speakers already touched on it, so we are not going to go back. 
I think what I'll just do is to share um, the recording so you can you can listen to the recording again. And the question is, um, why does a woman remain or stay in an abusive relationship? One of the speakers already touched on it, so um, we're just going to move on. The next question here is, at what point does a woman make up her mind to leave an abusive relationship? Sandra, I'm going to put you on the spot. I think um, that's um, sometimes a very difficult question to, to answer, and it very much depends on the woman. Um, and um, some people stay for many years. Um, friends of mine who I've been doing an event with just recently um, have been in abusive relationships for 20 years and have, have only really um, got out in the last five or six years. Um, and it all comes from knowing your rights, being supported and having the right support in place so that you can plan for the exit. It's, it's almost like a military operation in some cases because the abuse can be financial. Um, it can be the fact that your abuser or the aggressor, as the gentleman mentioned, um, is in control and in control of your every movement, your every thought, even to the extent of stopping you going out buying food and clothes for your children. And if you're in that situation and you don't know, you haven't got the financial means, it's very difficult very often to get away from the aggressor. But there is light at the end of the tunnel there are ways especially when you are given the right support and you you need a plan you need a, a plan of action as i say it's um sometimes it's just a case of having that plan and having help to get away thank you very much for that response sandra Okay, Sorina, sorry if I haven't pronounced your name right, but Sorina has a question. Sonita, sorry, Sonita. Sonita, are you here? Okay, she said, how can one tell if they are being manipulated to subjecting themselves to being a victim? Can someone answer that, please? Um, okay. Hi, uh, can I can I answer that, please? Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I think uh, most women we know deep down that this is wrong. Whatever uh, we are going through is wrong, and we keep on like accepting that. <clears throat> No, no, repeat the question again, uh, Amy. Repeat the question again. Sorry. Amy. I'll repeat the question. Oh, sorry. How can uh, one tell, okay, Amy, I've got it. Okay. How can one tell if they are being manipulated to subjecting themselves to being a victim? Um, at the end of the day, the stories. The story has become a song. Every time it happens, uh, as somebody said, uh, they can come with uh, expensive gifts. The stories, oh, I'll never do it again. The cries. And uh, as vulnerable as most women are, they just accept. But deep down, they know that this is just manipulation. They can talk to friends and friends like, oh, this is enough, this is done, you know, you don't have to accept that. And they, them themselves, they'll say, oh, I'm not going to take it anymore. But they keep on going back, knowing like, okay, this is just, uh, this is just a repeat. It will happen again and it will happen again. It will never end until 
you know what to do until you know when to leave or report or do something about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So the last question here is, what would you say to someone struggling to forgive? Mia J, please go on. Oh, thank you. I think that uh, what I would say for somebody who's struggling to forgive is to to stop and take a look at yourself and and, and think about what is that uh, feeling of whether it's hatred, contempt, animosity, or something doing to you. And if you are not feeling good as a result just think about the forgiveness is not for anybody else it's you it's for you for you to be able to achieve peace and be able to feel good on a daily basis that's really what matters at the end of the day thank you thank you very much Mia for that um so okay we have can, I just, can, I, just, can I just can i just reiterate that as yeah. a victim of abuse myself it, that forgiving is rightly about forgiving yourself and it, that is so important when you do forgive yourself you're able to see things for what it really was it was not your fault you did not ask for it it was not your destiny it was just that somebody wanted to control you for some reason and you were in that control for however long that they um, did what they did. But to forgive yourself is the starting point. Thank you very, very much for that contribution. Okay, so I'm just going to take the last, last, last final question. Please guys, no more questions. <laughs> okay, um, what can you do if you were being abused? sought help but never got it and how do you know sorry and how do you know it affected you or your child i think this is my understanding of the question can should i read that again yes. um, the question is like what what can you do if you were abused sought help but never got it and how do you know how deep it affected you or your child okay thank you very much and um, i don't know maybe i jump into that because one of the things as well that i wanted to add on the forgiveness is that like sandra said let be clear that forgiveness should be started by ourselves not by somebody who repeatedly do the same thing over and over again and and keep asking for, for forgiveness and the, the 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 mistake we do as well is probably believing that it's going to change one day and it's never changed so we have to be cautious of that and um, i think this question um sent me back to a case that probably a similar case that i'm dealing with right now of someone in a, in a relationship who, who has been abused mentally psychologically uh, uh and 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 all, all the time it happening and the person is thinking oh no um he he's he's kind he's doing that but it because of that it is happening because of that it, 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 the person always bring excuses on base of something else to think that once the person was wrong to you and come up with something nice it repaired the damage but this is repeating after each time so how do you um can you do is probably change the the, the person or the services you contacted now we have a lot of uh, information on the net either on google just even go in google just google it and see what kind of service providers exist that you can refer yourself to if you try for example with one organization or one person and you've been you know not successful try to um go online or change um 
tactic completely. Don't let those person people aside and look for someone else. Sometimes put your problem to someone, like someone else's problem, and see what advice will you get while even knowing that it's you seeking for, for advice. Because that keep your privacy on, on the request of, of support. And then what you get, you can apply it to your situation um, and not stuck on, 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 on sourcing. Because children go mental. Like actually, within the African community, one of the bigger problems we have, you might have heard about it, when, when, when children are, uh, African children are accused of gangsterism and so on. While it's not, they've been victim of bully, they've been victim of domestic violence, witnessing their mothers and, and, and people they, 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 they live with being by, uh, abused, and that affects them psychologically and mentally while they're growing up. And that becomes a routine of behaviors, and that's the problematic. So please, um, maybe if uh, 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 the question understand my, my, my point is, uh, don't give up, uh, go around and continue to seek for solution and you will get it. Thank you very much for that powerful contribution there, Lazan. Okay, we've come to the end of our discussion today. I would love to thank all our eloquent speakers from all over the world. This is a universal, um, you know, this is a universal um, talk. I would love to thank um, Vanessa Oji, Violetta Moni, Mieje, Ekemini, Lazan, Famida, Onyechi, Pemwa, um, Sophie, Lisa, Leka, Unisa, and obviously Councillor Sandra. Thank you so very much, all the speakers. We really, really do appreciate you. And for all our contributors, we really do appreciate your contribution. For everyone who have participated in this um, summit this year, we really, really thank you. We appreciate you coming here and we appreciate your time. We appreciate you staying with us from beginning to end. It's been an amazing experience. It's not going to end here for sure. We are going to put all the findings, all the everything that has been discussed here will be put um, together and sent to the necessary people here in Ireland. Um, it's not going to end here in Ireland as well because we have other things coming up in the new year. But I do really want to appreciate you all for coming here. I never introduced myself in the beginning and I always leave that to the end of a program. I am Ini, founder CEO of Love and Care for People based here in Ireland, but with a global reach. Thank you once again for being here. Thank you for all uh, and partners, um, in um, Sisters Keeper, um, Mia Jess, obviously you have several, several outfits, but thank you so much. We are so blessed to have all the speakers that have contributed to this conversation this evening. I would love to thank my moderator and colleague, Sharon. Thank you so very much. You know, you did all the hard work. Thank you. And obviously, uh, my host, Dr. Edo Mazombe. Thank you so very much. You know, I do really appreciate you all from the depth of my soul. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to having you again in some other program. We are going to have more collaborations in the future. And obviously, we hope to meet in the new year. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. And have a lovely morning, evening, night, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. We'll okay. see you next year. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. It was a good time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings. Thank you. Thank you. And good Thank luck everyone. to everyone. Blessings. Thank you. Peace. Peace. Bye. Peace. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. So I am going to end this now so we can all have a copper. Gerald, can you wait? Uh, thank you so much, love. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, Bye, Sharon. Sharon, okay. We'll talk in a minute. <laughs> okay.
All right, love, thank you.